Okay, I just want to welcome everybody to um, another another USA Hockey webinar series. We are very excited to have Dean Trialars and Heather Mannix here talking to us. So I'm going to just going to pass it over to Heather and Dean and uh, hope you guys and girls enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce one of the leading researchers in physical literacy and a good friend of mine, Dean Krilars. Um, Dean's a pretty humble guy, so I'll give you a quick background on him. So he's done uh, an extensive amount of research in the area of physical literacy, but he's also worked with some very high level sport organizations as well. Um, not limited to, but um, the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation, Swedish Gymnastics, FIFA, um, and he's also the scientific director at CRITEC, which is the um, Circus Research Institute associated with the Cirque du Soleil. And for those of you who don't know, performers in the Cirque du Soleil are arguably some of the most physically literate people walking this earth right now. Um, so USA Hockey recognizes the incredible importance of physical literacy, not just from a um, athletic performance standpoint or an injury prevention standpoint, but in like the holistic development of our kids as a whole. So um, we are super happy to and excited to have you, Dean. And with that, I'll give you the floor. Oh, thank you very much. And first it'd be, uh, I, I'm, there are some silver linings with the uh, COVID virus and uh, this is one of them. Um, uh, because of the fact that uh, a weird constellation of events occurred, uh, this allowed uh, this kind of webinar to uh, happen. So um, I, I also want to acknowledge the fact that USA Hockey is, uh, I, I almost had to give up my passport in Washington, D.C. a few years back when I said USA Hockey was one of the best places in the world implementing physical literacy. And I got text from the government saying, turn in your passport. Um, but I do believe that USA Hockey is one of the lead agencies in the world uh, trying to uh, use physical literacy for development of its uh, uh, players and coaches. So I, I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, so my seminar today webinar is uh, called Sport Powered by Physical Literacy. And what I'm going to be talking about is having you understand what physical literacy is and what it's not. And this will be a first in a series of webinars, hopefully to take us forward and saying, how do you actually employ it? So I'll give some hints as we go. Physical literacy can help sport, uh, whether it be in hockey, lacrosse, football, any of the sports that we can think of, both in two ways. One is in improving in sport excellence, meaning we're gonna have every individual uh, increase in their competency and their ability. So that's the classic performance excellence model, but also it is very valuable in helping people uh, keep people in sport. So excellence and participation. So they're not mutually exclusive. You want to have both excellence and performance and participation. And today I'm just going to touch on both of those. Um, the, the term physical literacy uh, is interesting. And I wrote a paper um, uh, in 2019, it was published in 2019, except in 2018, where did the term physical literacy comes? And you'll notice that I have a rather unique American flag illustrated in that. And that was your flag around 1884. And uh, in 1884, we see the first use of the term physical literacy. And a lot of people didn't know where it came from, but I'm gonna tell you that it came from the United States of America. And in 1885, an Army Corps of Engineers uh, remarked about some movement patterns uh, of people during a feast and he, said that people were moving with such eloquent movement that they had such great physical literacy. And that's the first time the term was used as far as we can tell. And then in around 1915, 1920, prior to the First World War, after computers were created, the term in the United States of America was actually used quite often because they saw physical literacy as important as mental literacy. Because if we don't have the physical fitness necessary to participate, in life, things are going to go south, and indeed they have for us. So I want to acknowledge the fact that really it is an American term, and uh, the world is on fire with this term uh, today. So with that in note, I want to just give you a sense for who around the world is using this term and why they're using it to set the background for how to use it in sport. So in Canada here, um, we have a consensus statement, and it's not that 
long ago that we created a consensus statement. 9,000 Canadians got together and discussed what is physical literacy. And you can download this off the internet. And we came up with a consensus statement in June of 2015. And that consensus statement, you don't, I'm not going to read it to you, is something you can pick up. And I do encourage you to read this because it's two pages long and something that you can read. Now, interestingly enough, at that time, I was involved with the Aspen Institute and working with Project Play. And at that same time, just a few weeks later, um, Project Play released this document, Physical Literacy in the United States. And this was their strategic plan. And we purposefully aligned those two documents so that both Canada and the United States would have some common footing in using the concept of physical literacy to uh, help uh, the public, sport, recreation, even in the education sectors. So I want to tell you that it is being adopted at a very high level in, in both our countries and around the world. Um, in last year in May, uh, in Canada, we had uh, one of our international physical literacy conferences and why I show you this picture is that the building that's in this image is the Canadian Human Rights Museum, uh, which we take very seriously, as you do in, 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 in the United States and around the world. Human rights are very important things. And uh, this International Physical Literacy Conference was in part housed inside of our Human Rights Museum because my government sees physical literacy as a human right. And, and this is a very, so I want to get a sense that physical literacy is more than just for sport. It has a much uh, larger uh, purpose. Um, and very importantly, uh, the World Health Organization um, last year, uh, well, a little bit a year, uh, over a year ago, released this document, More Active People for a Healthier World. And, and they included the term physical literacy and tied it to the development of more physically active people and less sedentary behavior. And this is critical because literally around the world, we're seeing the, a greater and greater adoption of this terminology. And yet still, people don't truly understand what it means yet. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll get a sense for what it really means. So for a long time, people have been saying, eat well and exercise regularly. And for the most part in Canada, the United States, and around the world, people aren't exercising enough and aren't eating appropriately. And so a lot of people said, hey, let's make people sweaty messes and make them more physically active. And certainly that's what we need to do. But just saying that has never made a change in the public. So um, this is an American study back in 2008, and that's uh, Colonel Troiano. And he did a study of about 6,000 Americans where he measured how much physical activity Americans are having uh, back in 2006, 2007. And he published it in 2008 and he demonstrated what percentage of people are meeting the minimum physical activity guidelines. And you'll notice the percentages in these diagrams are not encouraging that children under the age of 12, less than 50% were meeting uh, the criteria. Girls were behind the boys. And uh, by the time you're my age, uh, I'm 59, um, less than 97% of Americans are not meeting the physical activity criteria. Now, this situation in the United States was matched in Canada just a few years later, and there's no country in the world that's not seeing this problem. And that's why the World Health Organization and other groups are seeing physical literacy as a new way to combat physical inactivity. And that is one of its roles, but it also has a big role in sport. And I'll quickly show you this diagram. We know as scientists, geeky scientists like myself do these studies where we measure physical activity and we can show very clearly that all of these things around are related to physical inactivity. If you don't move a lot, you can get diseases, you can get fractures, you can pop your knees, and you can even have psychological uh, problems and conditions develop related to physical inactivity. And despite knowing this, despite this being a fact, people still don't get busy with being physically active because of the society and culture that we've created. And if you're physically inactive, this is a good slide and I wanna, because most of you in this audience are parents, I like to show you this picture. If children, 
and I'll call 21 year olds children, um, if young adults are physically inactive, so if you look at those seven bones on the top there, those are 21 year olds that are getting less than 3,500 steps a day. And that's a slice of their femur, their main bone in their, in their lower body. And, and it's very easy to see that the inactive bones, the inactive people, those seven on the top, taking less than 3,500 steps a day, have bones that are completely different than the bones of their peers, also 21 years of age, that get 15,000 steps a day. So you don't have to be a scientist to say which bones you want. You want the ones on the bottom. And so physical literacy is a means by which to achieve the bones on the bottom through a very special process. And we'll talk about that as we go through. So last year, and I won't be too sciencey, guys, I'm gonna talk really hardcore about what physical literacy is at a parent and coaching level. But last year we wrote this paper on physical literacy, physical activity and health, mental health, physical health and social health. And over here <clears throat> was the first ever circuit diagram, <coughs> excuse me, where we demonstrated what physical literacy is in a very simple diagram. And I'll show you a better one in a second. But what, this was the first paper ever to articulate to say that perhaps physical literacy in green, in the green box, is the precursor to being physically active. And if you're physically active, we already know that you're gonna get better physical health, better mental health, and better social health. So this paper was very important for us to have in the scientific world to talk about how do we get a healthier world, healthier people. And so this was a very well accepted paper and uh, only published last year. And then we demonstrated in the same year, a paper that demonstrated that if you're physically literate, you're much more likely to become physically active in this study. And that is a, the missing link. If you're physically literate, maybe you become physically active and you're physically active then you'll get better social, mental, and physical health. So <clears throat> that's good news for society that maybe physical literacy is a missing link to becoming physically active. But what does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of if you're a coach or a parent? And so if you read all of the definitions in the world on physical literacy, I've taken the top 10 words out of all the definitions and they're not really that different. And if you look at the words, as a parent or a coach, there's not a word in there that you look at and you're saying, hey, that's not what I do. You should say, yeah, I'm about developing movement skills. I'm about developing competence. It's a lifelong thing. I want kids to have the knowledge and understanding to do it. It's about you. And I want you to be motivated and confident as well. That's what physical literacy is all about. Not about creating kids that are sweaty messes, which is a good thing. It's about creating people that are competent, confident movers and are motivated to move. So when you simplify physical literacy to its core, it's illustrated in this picture here. We wanna create children and adults that are competent in moving, that are confident in moving, that are motivated to move, and they definitely enjoy moving, which is clearly illustrated in this uh, parkour uh, competitor who's a good friend of mine. And if you put this into a diagram, and yes, you're right. If you look at her upside down, she's got an upside down smile. And uh, so she's not a frowning, she's actually smiling upside down, which is a wonderful thing. Um, if you think about physical literacy as a cycle, this kind of animation shows you what physical literacy is really about. It's a positive feedback cycle that if you develop movement competence, you'll get confidence. If you get confidence, you'll be motivated. If you're motivated, you'll participate in land, air, ice, snow, and water. And on top of that, you'll feel comfortable moving in front of others and you won't shy away from moving in front of others and you'll feel good about moving in front of audiences. So as a coach or a parent, your job to develop physical literacy, physically literate kids is really this positive feedback cycle and giving them the ability to move in all different contexts, land, air, ice, snow, and water, and as well as in different social settings. Because I'll tell you, working in high performance sport, I've seen many competitors who have good competence, who can move well on ice, 
but uh, but if they don't have the confidence at the same time they have the competence, they fail. And one missing element that we really don't think about in the sport world is how do you actually develop confident, competent movers? What's your lesson plan? How are you actually developing confidence? And I watch a lot, a lot of uh, coaching sessions and it is very easy to erode the confidence of athletes. So we really have to think about that. And USA Hockey was revolutionary many years ago in creating ads, if you remember them, where they actually showed this is physical literacy. And they talked about kids playing in, on land, on their bikes, uh, on, in water, in the air. And they didn't even show a puck or a hockey stick. And they were really messaging that we want children to be able to be competent in all those environments, not just on ice. We need ice competence, but we need the ability to move in all those other environments. And that's critical. So this positive feedback cycle is the core of the physical literacy process. And it is critical to think about what are you doing to make every single one of these arrows in action in your coaching sessions? Because in the sport world, we often focus really on technical ability and skills, and that's okay. But at the same time, we have to think about what do we do to develop confidence? How do we make sure we keep the fire going for motivation? And therefore, kids will participate more. Because if you break the cycle at any point, what it will do is stop the kid from wanting to participate and they exit sport. In the United States and Canada, sadly, 70% of children exit sport by the age of 13. And largely due to the fact that this cycle is being broken. So as a coach, this is not complex. There's nothing fancy about the words in this diagram, but we can't forget that physical literacy is not just movement skills. It's psychological, confidence, motivation, and those are critical determinants. So physical literacy is not just about making a better body. It's about making a better brain and making a brain that can handle decision-making, that can problem solve, that can be creative in different moving context. And your brain is created by what we do, by how we move. So physical literacy is about making better bodies and better brains. And more importantly, brains and bodies are never separated. It's about creating them at the same time. The other element that I'll mention, since this audience is very hockey specific, and I played hockey to the junior level and still play around on the rink occasionally, but I'll tell you, I do know that identity is really critical and physical literacy is part about who you are. And if your life is solely hockey, that's all you live and breathe, your identity is narrow. And if hockey is taken away from you, which happens a lot, that means that you're left with an identity that's based on a very, a very, um, how would you say, narrow uh, base. So the goal is if you become physically literate, your identity becomes robust. And if you have to transition out of performance hockey, you don't go through identity crisis. So physical literacy isn't just about making better players and keeping them in the sport. It's about protecting them psychologically as well. One of the things that people often do when they think about physical literacy is <clears throat> they try to make it related to other things. And I'll tell you what physical literacy is not. Physical literacy is not physical activity. You can be a very physically active person running on a treadmill, but you won't be physically literate. You'll be physically proficient, but you won't be physically literate. Those are two different things. There, there is an ability to become a sweaty mess 60 minutes a day as a child. That means that you have adequate physical activity, but it doesn't mean you're physically literate. So those two words are two different things. Physical literacy is also not fitness. Physical literacy is, uh, is not fitness. If you're physically literate, you become physically active. If you're physically active, you can become fit. There, there are three different constructs. Fitness is strength, endurance, power, cardiovascular uh, endurance, flexibility, and body composition. Those are things that come from being physically active. And the last thing I'll say about what physical literacy isn't it's not fundamental movement skills. Fundamental movement skills are very important in life. Being able to throw, catch, 
slide on ice, being able to fall, being able to avoid a collision. Those are parts of the competency elements of physical literacy, but they're not physical literacy in and of themselves because there's that psychological stuff too, confidence, motivation, et cetera. So I wanna go right to the point. What does a physical literacy enriched coaching session look like? And what does that mean? And if you take that away from today, that's a huge accomplishment from a short seminar. So I'm really happy to say USA Hockey has created a wonderful infographic called the five essential elements of a quality practice. And so I've just taken their banner here and I've broken it up into this bit. They've identified five of many, there's probably 30 quality uh, uh, elements that should be part of every coaching session. And they've identified five, fun, um, lots of touches on the puck, problem solving, the ability to make the practice like a game. And the last one is to have the appropriate level of challenge. So I'm gonna use physical literacy to talk through these five. So decision-making. So there is really good evidence that if you do something as a coach to allow children to have decision-making, to create problems for them to solve on ice, they'll become more creative and creativity on ice is a really important thing, how to deke out a player on the field of play. But it also has benefits to real life over, I mean, life beyond um, uh, hockey. So decision-making is a critical element to give the kids, not telling them what to do. We can do that sometimes, but actually give them problem-solving ability. Why that's important is that last November, I published this paper. And this paper was the first ever study to demonstrate that if you construct the right type of problem-solving settings for children through physical literacy, they'll become resilient. And resilience is really the ability to overcome challenges, which is what we want. And so this paper demonstrated that the best predictor of resilience in children is physical literacy, not how much activity they do, not how fit they are, but how physically literate they are, which is really interesting. So in that paper, we demonstrated, like I showed you earlier, that competence leads to confidence, leads to motivation, leads to participation. All we added in this paper was the concept of a positive challenge. How do you as a coach create a challenge to every participant on your team? It's not just a level of challenge for the best or a level of challenge for the worst. How do you create a challenge that is a problem where every child can actually engage into becoming more competent and confident at the same time. And this is what the five essential components of a quality session is engaged around. It's called optimal challenge theory. If it's too easy, you're out. If it's too hard, you're out. If it's just right for you, you're in. So the game is for a coach is how do I create a level of challenge for every level of ability? And so this becomes difficult because what we want is that every child can get into the process. And if you have a big range of abilities on your team, you as a coach have to think about creating a whole bunch of challenges so everybody can get in on a challenge that's appropriate to them. And so this is why we say, we call this constructing a positive challenge. As a coach, you have to create your coaching, coaching sessions so that everybody can get in on the game and feel this positive feedback cycle happening to them. So in summary, we call that a level of challenge for every level of ability. And it's really easy to teach to the best or the worst. It's hard, and I, I understand that it's challenging. How do you create a level of challenge for every level of ability? I will run a whole webinar on how to do that in practices. And I'm really looking forward to that webinar. The other one that's important is how many touches you put on a puck. There is clear evidence that in many hockey practices in the past, and Ken will like the fact that I'm about to mention the term horseshoe drill. The horseshoe drill is one of the best examples of not giving time on task. It is a drill that we've had in hockey for ages, and it's something that we need to eliminate. And I am very happy to say you can take a horseshoe drill and physical literacy enrich it 
and make sure that kids get a large amount of time on task. They touch the puck a lot because we know that if you want to develop competence in children, you have to give them time on task. And drills that have kids standing in line for extended periods of time and one at a time going through something do not give time on task. And it is really critical that everybody needs to feel engaged in, the, in a progression. They want to belong. So creating a level of challenge to every level of ability. The other one that is not listed on the USA Hockey Essential 5, but is implied in it, is the concept of competence. And I challenge all the coaches listening today to say, what are you doing in your lesson plans? And I'll, I'll cover this in another webinar. What are you doing in your coaching sessions to create not just competent kids, good technical ability, but confident movers? And, and really think about that because it is very easy to say words as coaches that can take away confidence from children. So you have to create in your coaching sessions authentic training circumstances so that kids can see how these skills can be used in games. That's when we talk about it like is like hockey. But you also have to be very careful, careful with your words and practice design not to steal confidence away from children. Yeah, you might be making five of 20 kids being confident, but you might also be destroying confidence in half of the kids. So we'll talk about that another time, but I challenge you to think about what are you doing to create confidence and what are you doing that you shouldn't be doing to steal it away. This is something that Heather Mannix takes very seriously and her supervisor, Amanda Visick, fun, enjoyment, and happiness. And we know that the number one and two reasons people stay in activity are for fun and friendship. So fun and is in the moment. Enjoyment is thinking back. Was that a fun, enjoyable practice? Yeah, that was. Was it fun? Yeah, it was fun. I was in it, it was fun. Happiness is a much bigger thing. But in the end of the day, if you don't create fun enjoyment in your coaching sessions, you're gonna get people that drop out and wanna leave for the right reasons. We want to create quality sport experiences and in quality sport experiences, it means fun and enjoyment. And Amanda and Heather did created the fun integration theory and they have some really good tips for what is fun from the point of view of a child. And it's trying hard, being a good sport, getting positive coaching, learning and improving. Everybody wants to learn and improve and children see that as fun, which means a level of challenge to every level of ability. The other element that's embedded inside of the physical literacy enriched coaching session is the concept of connection. It is really important for a coach to think about the fact that it's not just about creating friendship in sport, it's about creating connection. You don't need to have friendship with every single team member, but you do want to connect to them because, hey, we all enjoy hockey or I really like the hockey rank. That's connections, connection to a place. So when you're thinking about your practices, you have to think about how am I creating connections for all my players? Connections to other people, which could mean friendship, connections to places like a rink, connection to objects like their equipment, connections to groups. I'm a hockey player. Why I'm talking about connection is that there's very clear evidence that if you create connection ability for your for your players, they'll want to belong. And belonging is what we want. So I've modified the diagram here to show you that in your coaching sessions, active participation, you should think about how are you creating opportunities to make connections to people, places, objects, and things. And if you create connection, you're going to create relations, relationships, and relationships drive motivation. As well, if you create fun and enjoyment in your coaching sessions, you'll drive motivation. And so you can see here, this is not a complex diagram, but it is a diagram that helps you as a coach think about the things that are essential to have in your coaching sessions. So it is really important in sport to create positive feelings. It doesn't mean that there, there aren't negative feelings on the field of play or in a training session. You can be worried, you can be concerned, but the trick is to create a situation where there are more positive feelings than negative. So that you actually have 
create these circumstances where children can see that positive feelings can overcome negative feelings. So fun is in the moment. It's not just smiles. Fun's the moment. Enjoyment is looking back. Hey, that was a good drill. How do you create confidence? Well, confidence is a positive feeling. I can do this. I want every child in my coaching sessions to feel I can do this. Confidence means I have the ability. Are you giving enough time on task? Self-confidence is a very important thing. That's when a child feels that they're competent and confident at the same time, because that's what we want. Resilience, which we talked about earlier, is I think I can overcome this challenge. I'm gonna get into this drill and I'm gonna do it because you've created a drill that I can enter into and get better at. Self-esteem means, hey, I, I deserve this. This is happiness. I deserve a really good quality coaching session. And finally, belonging in hockey is not about fitting in to the mold. It's about saying, I have a place here as a human being, as an individual. So coaches really need to focus on creating positive feelings in sport. It's not about eliminating negatives. It's about creating positives that overcome negatives, resilience. So this circuit diagram is really what you want to think about and you want to turn the green light onto it. You want to make sure you're developing movement skills, which then leads to confidence. And we want to create confident circumstances where that drives motivation. And if you're motivated, you're going to participate more. And the more you have time on task, the more confidence you get. That's turning on the physical literacy cycle. And that's what you want to imagine for every player on your team, engaging this positive feedback cycle and not cutting it in any spot, which that means that you turn off the cycle, which is a quick way to lose your players. So I'm gonna finish up with a couple of slides on can we measure physical literacy? Now I'm not gonna ask any coach to do that, but I am gonna tell you, we do some science and we do measure physical literacy. And one of the tools, there's many, there's over seven different tools for measuring physical literacy. One of them is called the play tools, physical literacy assessment for youth. And here's some data from, from that. We measured in 6,000 children, males and females, their ability to throw a ball. And we measured 18 different movement skills. And what, what I want you to see in this diagram is that in Canada, United States, Trinidad, Sweden, every country that I go, we see that girls and boys at the age of six throw about the same. But by age seven, boys throw better than girls, not because they're boys, but because we mistreat girls. And then as they develop um, with age and through the experiences that they have, the girls lag behind the boys. And by age eight, girls' competence in throwing is lagging behind the males. And you can start thinking about hockey competencies here too, about USA hockey and male hockey versus female hockey. This is 16,000 kids where we measured 18 movement skills. So there's 18 movement skills on this list. Some for body control, some for object manipulation, some for moving and some for controlling your body. And what I want you to see from this diagram is that when boys are better than girls, males are better than females, the bars are on the right-hand side. When girls are better than boys, the bars are on the left-hand side. Now, society says that there should be no difference there should be no difference at all. And why I show you this is that um, this is gender bias. This means that in sport, recreation, physical education, we're not giving equal opportunity for females to develop their competency in movement. And, and what that means is that when we measure the confidence in females, what we find is that at age eight, boys and girls develop confidence about the same at age six and age seven. But when we measure confidence in girls, because they lose confidence at age eight relative to the boys, their confidence sinks. And this is true for boys as well who don't develop confidence. And here's the sad news, and this is physical literacy in a nutshell. When we ask children, if you tilt your head sideways, you'll be able to read the question, I believe that being physically active makes me happy. And if you ask five-year-olds that question, they all say, yeah, we're crazy with happiness when we move. Six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, boys and girls are all happy moving up to age eight. 
but girls lose confidence relative to the boys because of gender mistreatment. And then they lose confidence the year after, in average, and then they associate unhappiness with movement. This is a wrong that can be corrected with physical literacy. We have now published two studies that clearly demonstrate you can eliminate this gender gap in movement competence using a physical literacy cycle that I showed you before. It is so good at not at fixing this that it can also eliminate injuries, not eliminate, dramatically reduce injuries that were associated with females in the past, in particular anterior cruciate ligament injuries in the knees in soccer and football, uh, lacrosse and rugby. We've been able to dramatically reduce those injuries using this approach, not a physical activity approach, not a fitness approach, but a physical literacy approach. Hey, Dean. So what I, yeah, Quick I, I think I'm done. This, yeah. Okay. Um, go back uh, one slide. So yeah. just to be clear, physiologically speaking, up to a certain point, there should be no differences in competencies, physical competencies with girls and boys. I just want to make right. sure. So, right. Yeah. Right. Under the age of 12, prior to sex differences really appearing, sex is basically hormonal and, gen and genetic. Gender is how you want to be treated or how I treat you. So in our physical education curriculums in the United States and Canada, by grade four, all children should be competent, entry level competent in those land-based movement skills, that list. Now in Canada and the United States, sadly, almost no children, the graph on the left shows that there's only one female that has all 17 of those skills and two males. The females are less apt than the males, but our entire movement suppressed culture doesn't allow physical competencies to develop. And that is bad for the males as well as the females. And it should be true, it should be true under the age of 12 that the ability to move, the competency in movement should be identical between males and females. Once hormones kick in like testosterone, males may be able to kick the ball farther, but males and females should kick the same ability. So that's really critical. So what I'm trying to present to you is this cycle. And this cycle is the engine behind physical literacy. And we have a much more complicated diagram, which Ken likes. I'll show you that in a future one. And, uh, and, and it does help becoming a better coach. So into the future, I'm gonna give a seminar called Physical Literacy Enriched Coaching Sessions. And what does that look like? What does that mean on ice and off ice in the hockey setting? If you're gonna include physical literacy in, the, in, in hockey, and I'm also going to produce for you guys a physical literacy and, uh, and sport newsletter that will go out, as well as a new physical literacy and sport video uh, that will go out through your, through your readership. So this isn't the end point of physical literacy. This is the starting dialogue. So I'll stop there to see if there's any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Dean. This is awesome stuff. Um, getting some good feedback. But so next week, um, we are going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into creating and setting the environment for kids and practice and stuff. Um, can you briefly touch on the, the audience effect and how that impacts learning new skills? Um, and then maybe yeah. how that a coach can progress something like that. Yeah. So one, one of the, uh, in many high performance sports settings that I work with, um, the audience effect, as you're calling it, is, is a big factor. And um, one of the things that we find is, and, and I didn't really explicitly talk about it in the circuit diagram, but when you're developing children, it is critical to develop confidence at the same time as competence. But what's really important is that my confidence is tied to how comfortable I feel moving in front of other people. And in coaching and sport, we often forget about the fact that it is critical to progress the audience effect. So I argue every child should feel comfortable moving in front of every other child. In addition, every child should feel comfortable moving in front of different audiences like a high level coach or in front of their parents, or if you're older, in front of a, uh, a relationship uh, like your boyfriend or girlfriend. But you know, we never think about that in terms of our coaching sessions and we think, hey, just get up there and do it in front of an audience. And there is a way to progress the audience effect. And we have seen at the high performance level, if you don't think about that, there are very many 
highly competent people who don't understand how to perform in front of audiences and they c collapse under that pressure. So in the physical literacy world, we teach people how to feel comfortable moving in front of audiences. And it's not just say, get up there in front of the audience. There is a way to progress it. So a great question. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's a big thing, especially, you know, with kids when they, um, when they have to, you know, go to different tryouts or at, you know, development camps or tryouts for those, um, knowing that people are in the stands watching them, it obviously, it, it will impact their, their performance. Um, right. And so, so one of the cr greatest negatives we see is when you have a lineup and you have kids performing in front of other kids, they can be socially inhibited. And because even though there's kids behind you, you know, they're looking at you. So that socially inhibits you and creates peer pressure, which is the worst way to learn a movement skill. Mm -hmm. So you need to get, get, rid of, get rid of that effect. Do you have any tips on how a coach might do that? I mean, I know like with some things we do with um, like chaos drills where everybody is doing, you know, the same thing at the same time, nobody really has time to look and watch and, you know, criticize somebody else's movement because everybody's actually participating. Right. And, and so, a lot of people, when they listen to this, can negatively react saying, well, Dean, you're against competition. No, I'm, I'm a super competitive guy. But taking adult competition and applying it to a child is the wrong thing to do. You want to create rivalry at the right level at the early stages and progress competition and progress the audience effect. And I, I, I have many tips. And when we do the webinar on physical literacy and coaching, I'm going to deep dive into how to do that and modify your drills so you can progress rivalry and progress the audience effect. Awesome. Um, so one more I have is obviously a lot of people have a lot of time on their hands and kids are looking for things to do and, um, and you know, to, to get better, not only at hockey, but become better athletes. Um, yes. Do you have any suggestions that are not necessarily hockey related um, that mm -hmm. kids can do at home to help improve hand-eye coordination or just overall physical literacy that'll help not only in hockey, but become better athletes overall? Yeah, I mean, I'm to put you on the spot. The, <laughs> no, it's a good, no, it's a great one. I mean, especially in this uh, era. Um, well, USA Hockey and many of the NGBs in the United States are truly adopting the notion of sport is about developing a person as a whole, then the athlete, then the player in the specific sport. And I completely endorse that thinking. And it, it's really interesting because I would truly argue that. If you put your kid only in hockey, which is a very common thing in Canada, and stick him only, and they'll become physically proficient in hockey. But if you actually look at the hand-eye coordination drills that you can do that are not hockey specific, the, the people that we, in the performance world, in the performance hockey world, have unbelievable control of their top uh, hand on the stick, which controls the ability to control that puck on the stick. And that comes not just from you know, playing with the stick, but other things like lacrosse, juggling, all these other different skills that are not on ice. We know very clearly that there's transferability of many different movement patterns from one different context to another. And so it is really important for parents to say, yes, I want my kid to be in hockey and hopefully my kid wants that too, but to give them a diversity of experiences in land, air, ice, snow, and water and not just pigeonhole them solely to the hockey experience. Because there is very clear data that shows that the best performers in the world had a diverse movement experience growing up. And that's irrefutable. It is true, I cannot lie. You can be a great hockey player just doing hockey. But the best of the hockey players came from a diverse movement experience. So parents, think about a way, and coaches, don't be a hoarder. Don't just hoard your kids and don't say, you have to do hockey, you can't do football, you can't do soccer. Find, learn about the child as a whole and realize that they do all these other skills and encourage them to do that, not just hoard them within the hockey context. Everybody needs to, it, we don't have a multi-sport problem, we have a multi-coach problem. Coaches need to cooperate between sports and, and I'm very proud to say that the NGBs in the United States in many different sports are now beginning to do really good communications between them saying, how do we make a better athlete development model that allows our children to participate in different sports? So a uh, great question, Heather. Yeah. What are your thoughts on doing, you know, like specific activities, like learning how to juggle or jumping? Yeah, rope? sure. 
you know, there's nothing, there's nothing like giving a, a child a competency progression and putting him into it. I mean, Heather, you know full well, I'll, I'll say one thing. You could send out to this entire group the performance core. So we've got, as you know, I've given USA Hockey the performance core routine. And it's got level one, level two, level three. And we have children that are five years old doing this core routine. So, and it goes all the way up to high performance circus artists. Um, this is not a trivial core routine, but once kids get locked into it, they see themselves getting better. They got, become more confident and it's a physical literacy enriched core routine, not a strength core routine, but a physical literacy and core routine. So I encourage you to send out the link to the performance core routine. And that's something that every kid can do. And as a really good example of physical literacy enriched exercise. So send that out. And uh, that's something that, that the kids can do now and get a rock solid core. <laughs> Perfect. I have two questions here. Okay. Um, so the first one coming in is movement screens. For example, um, the FMS, SF, SFMA have become popular yeah. in recent years. Some of the research yeah. and literature in, in review of these systems are mixed. What are your thoughts on their value here? Yeah, what a, what a great question. And certainly that's my research area. So I'll, I'll be able to help you out with that. So functional movement screens and FMS and happens to have the same name as fundamental movement skills. They're two different things. So in the rehabilitation, athletic trainer, athletic therapist, physical therapist world, we developed a thing called functional movement screens. And so I'll speak to that one. And the concept behind that was absolutely right. There's no doubt that looking at movement competency and trying to find deficits in movement competency might be linked to injury potential. The problem is that the functional movement screens that people developed were really not that good for high performance sports. They were really more generic audiences. And literature review after literature review after literature review shows that these fun functional movement screens are not prescriptive nor prognostic. Prescriptive means they don't tell you how to fix the problem. And prognostic means that they actually don't predict injuries. And what that means is that if you fix the, the problems on the screen, it doesn't reduce injuries. But the concept is right. So, so large number of studies have shown that. And I'm not saying they can't be useful, but to say that you have to fix them is the problem. So I, I, as a person who believes in movement competency to a high degree to prevent injuries, believe in the concept of screening. But to say that that one screen is predictive in our sports has uh, already been shown not to be true. It's not mixed. It says on aggregate, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value. Um, uh, but what are the competencies that people need on the field of play to perform? What are the competencies that actually lead to injury? When we think that way, um, there have been studies that show that very specific competencies can eliminate injuries. I'll give you the example. In football uh, and soccer, the ability to cut or change directions when you're on land is related to injury potential. And there's now very clear evidence that if you improve that competency, and in females, I can tell you the numbers, females pop their anterior cruciate ligament six times to every one male. And that is a gender difference. When we give them the competency level that they should have, because they weren't given it because of our um, gender bias, it reduces their injury rate to 1.5 to one, meaning that the competency was responsible for four injuries, not the fact that they're male and female but because we didn't give them the same time on task, leading to deficits in motor competence, leading to much higher injury rates. So um, that thinking is good thinking. It just needs to evolve. I'm glad you brought Long that up. Long answer. <laughs> no, that, Long that's answer. A great, no, that was a great answer. Um, we have another great one here. So how do you think this information can be implemented for those who work in the collegiate setting? So what oh, I take from that is, is um, you know, is there a, a cutoff, like you have to be physically literate by a certain age or you're, you know, go ahead and Yeah, answer. great question. Oh, ab absolutely. Great question. So in Canada, through the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is our safety organization, 
we developed a, a program called movement preparation. And uh, movement preparation was designed for soccer and it has levels one to eight. What's the published ones have levels one to three. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, publicly available ones have levels one to three. Now it's really interesting because at NCAA division one soccer, you would still start off with level one. We don't have age associated with it. And then you progress to level eight. But the game is that into the future, if you're a 12, 13, 14 year old, you should be at level six. But right now the range is so big because nobody focuses on that, that we don't have an age criteria for competency. So you have to say physical literacy can develop and there's no, it goes from beginner to expert. So there's never an end point. Your physical progressions can continuously improve easily until at the Olympic level until 40. Um, if you enter hockey at 40 years of age, and there's a huge rush of that in Canada, you enter for the first time, you're in a competency progression as well. So it's age independent, first answer. Um, the second part is that physical literacy is as important at, is, is, is age independent. It goes from cradle to grave. So um, even if you're at the, at the Olympic level, there is benefits to doing this diversity in training. And when we get to the deeper circuit of the physical literacy circuit, when we go beyond the basic diagram I showed you today in the subsequent webinars, you'll see how, because at, at the circus level, at the highest level of circus performance, we keep driving physical literacy and our injury rates are quite low and our durability, which is a term that comes from physical literacy, our, the durability of the athlete is ridiculous. They last 30, 40 years as opposed to burning out quickly. So that's a little bit of a roundabout answer, but I, it, it's not age dependent and it means you can develop physical literacy at any age. Perfect. Um, another really good one here. So are there any um, evidence views or views on the impact of physical liter or on physical literacy, in both genders when kids play on all boys versus all girls versus mixed gender teams? Yeah. I don't know if there is, but yeah, what, yeah well, there, well, there is indirectly. So um, when you remember the diagram that I showed you, um, this one, there is lots of studies that focuses on confidence studies that focus on confidence, motivation, or participation, but nobody's looked at the diagram. So what, what I'll answer is that from the field of research that's looked at um, leagues based on competency level as opposed to sex, um, so ability-based leagues, um, there is some really good evidence that females do way better in that context. Males don't objectify females in that context. That's really important. When do we, and it's a very interesting discussion to say, should we have mixed leagues or not? Um, I like equal ability leagues and allowing high level of ability, which we're pretty good at in, in hockey, but we maybe don't allow a level of challenge for all levels of ability. So we lose people from participating at other levels. So I'd like to see a broader range of ability in, in hockey and all sports for that matter. And then whether we should have mixed genders, I think there is a time and a place for that. Um, uh, and I think up to a certain age, I, I could agree with that. The logistics behind it becomes complicated. I will answer very powerfully though, I do not believe at all in female only physical education classes. I think that that's not good. Do we need them for the time being? Yes, we do. Should they be eliminated 20 years from now? Yes. Physical literacy enriched physical education does the right thing and you don't need segregation of the sexes. Um, but in specific sports, there is a time and a place for segregation um, between the sexes and I'm using that word very specifically, but there's also perhaps a time to, uh, to meld them together. So equal ability leagues, I'm all about. Awesome. Um, what do you think would be the best carryover sport for hockey? <laughs> Great question. Is, is there, is there, you know, I had a slide and I didn't put it inside here because, and I'm very sensitive to it. I have a slide that what my kids did. And, um, and, and it's interesting because up to the age of 12 or 13, I, I don't want to take away passion from a child. If a child has passion to do something, 
that's a wonderful thing. And if they want to play violin, they want to play hockey, and it's inside of them to do that, that's specialization. Specialization is good. That's passion. That's that. Diversification plus specialization makes a durable child. Over-specialization is wrong. So specialization means a kid's following their passion. We should give them that. But diversification with specialization is the end game. Over-specialization is dangerous for a whole bunch of reasons from identity, physical dangers, and psychological dangers. So I'm gonna answer it that way. And so physical literacy means you love your hockey, get in hockey, but diversify as broadly as you can. And don't just pigeonhole them to that one specialty because that's over-specialization. So there is no perfect one. All right, so this is our last question um, and it holds a special place in Ken's heart and Dave's heart as well. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so do you consider parkour and martial arts to be particularly strong activities for developing physical literacy? Absolutely. Um, collision avoidance is a, a really big part of many sports. And as coaches, in the physical literacy world, we'd say collision avoidance is a movement competency. And I need to create confident movers in collision avoidance and in a game context. So as a physical literacy person, I would devise methods by which grappling was occurring or collisions were occurring and how to avoid collisions that can be meaningfully applied in the context of hockey and or transferred into it. So for me, Falling collision avoidance needs to be purposefully planned by design as opposed to by chance. So sports and activities like grappling, sports, um, uh, judo, you name it, all have its place uh, in developing core competencies in, in, in a sport like hockey. And there's dramatic carryovers from them. The problem is that there's no perfect constellation of them and so i can't answer but what if kids with parkour develop lots of unbelievable skills um another one that 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 martial arts does very well is understanding what the difference is between play fighting and actual fighting i'm a i'm a big fan of play fighting i'm an anti-fan of heavy duty fighting um but to me understanding physical contact and when it goes past into the violent stage and there needs to be taught. It's not just a thing you hope for. And we need our hockey players to understand that difference.